All right, here we go. Hi, everybody. My name is Brad Winnett. I'm the president of Tracket. Uh, I also have Ludo Francois, uh, my partner and CEO of the company here, as well as a couple other Tracket members on the team. Um, Tracket is a seven year old advanced consulting partner for AWS really a software development company that's really good at all things AWS. Um, we do do things like your normal sort of DevOps um, architecture, um, uh, design, deployment, optimization, sort of the normal things you'd associate with uh, consulting practice, but everything we do do is flavored by our software development approach. So we're huge believers in infrastructure as code uh, and automation with CloudFormation, Terraform, et cetera. So it's a big part of our business. Uh, we also do quite a few things uh, or some things that are outside of just the perfect part of AWS. We'll do UI, UX, front end, back end design for people, API integration, those kind of things as well. So with that, uh, I want to transition to what we're going to talk about today, which is migrating to AWS with the aid of a partner like Trackit. Uh, so let's talk about that. Um, this part of our business is definitely accelerating, and I'm going to talk about why really in the next slide that we see people really considering migration, if my PowerPoint will actually work. Hmm. There we go. Okay, let's make sure I didn't miss one. So why are people migrating to any public cloud really? Because a lot of this does apply. And there are definitely a variety of reasons. So some of it is, the fact it could be, uh, I have a small environment, I am scaling. How do I scale effectively without having to go out and buy a lot of equipment, wait for the equipment to get here, integrate the equipment on site? Where do I put it on site? So there's some of those reasons. Another one that we see quite often is it's time for a technology refresh. And now I have the decision, okay, I'm gonna refresh my technology. So either I make another big capital expenditure uh, or I do something different. If you make the capital expenditure and you are really solid in knowing that you're gonna use that equipment full time for the next three years or whatever your depreciation cycle is, it's probably not a bad choice to do things that way. Yeah, somebody else is coming in. Uh, on the other hand, the great thing about going to a cloud-based solution is if you make it, you don't need to make a big upfront investment. And if you decide that you don't need all that compute or storage or whatever, or that your business changes or circumstances change, or you have the wrong equipment, you can tear down instantly what you stand up. So it really helps from uh, the standpoint of being very agile in how you manage your business. Um, so you don't have to be locked into today's technology. You can use the technology that's appropriate today, but six months from now or nine months from now or a year from now, if there's something better comes along, maybe it's a different kind of compute instance, maybe it's a different kind of storage, uh, you can almost immediately change over to that new technology. A real strong driver for using the cloud. Um, from a security uh, and resilience standpoint and redundancy standpoint, many of these uh, are just native to using a public cloud like AWS. If, for example, you're interested in that disaster recovery, disaster recovery is very easy to implement in the cloud environment, whereas uh, an on-premise or private cloud environment, you need to go find another place to put the gear, you need to buy more gear, uh, and then manage that gear in multiple environments, figure out how replication works with these other things. Uh, that just comes native as part of something like the AWS cloud. Uh, uh, Big one that we're also seeing are, are companies that are experiencing just explosive growth. And a lot of that right now is coming from internet of things as well as uh, new, uh, new compute um, paradigms like artificial intelligence and machine learning. These are really uh, causing people to rethink how they buy uh, or deploy infrastructure, especially with Internet of Things. It's very hard to gauge exactly what a growth uh, curve is going to be. Um, so if you're taking telemetry data or you have other data acquisition um, uh, components and infrastructure that's out in the world just starting to generate data, uh, the ability to scale to whatever 
levels you really need to. It's just a core part of the cloud and it's another big driver uh, to move to a public cloud. Um, I'll also talk about one case study we had later where uh, a cloud provider just decided to get out of the business. So we had a customer who had to face the choice of either finding another private cloud provider or migrating to a public cloud. So we are actually seeing quite a bit of that as there's a lot of consolidation in the cloud business. And then the last one that we're seeing is businesses are becoming much more global these days, particularly with the pandemic, <clears throat> the ability to work from anywhere and to work for anyone anywhere is becoming a driver. And the ability to do that with a dispersed or geographically uh, disparate kind of uh, public cloud architecture can make it quite a bit easier to provide good levels of service for those customers and for your employees who might not be local anymore. <clears throat> so from a benefit standpoint, and these were, most of these came from some of the big, some of AWS's big customers, which they list down here, but also IDC and the other major uh, consulting companies out there kind of align along the same way. Uh, there are cost savings, and this oftentimes is sort of the first thing that people think of, hey, I don't wanna buy on-premise, I don't wanna pay for colo, I don't wanna pay for the real estate anymore. Are there ways I just can find cost savings by going to the public cloud? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So there's a TCO part of that in terms of being able to avoid CapEx or to use exactly what I need at any one point in time versus over-provisioning like I normally do with a private cloud or on-premise environment. Um, for example, GE saw G is obviously a very big company. So uh, a very large reduction in their overall cost with a, a nice TCO. But what really people find out is after they move to the cloud, there's other benefits that are actually more compelling or can be more compelling than that first cost savings, which could be an, an initial driver. So one, it's you can, you can drive good productivity or extra productivity out of your staff. Uh, and that's partially by being able to be more uh, prescriptive and uh, incremental in the kind of jobs that are getting done there. Um, and it also really helps just from a sysadmin standpoint, you can save a lot of time just in sysadmin about not having to worry about things like physical security or the physical management of infrastructure, power supplies dying, disk drives dying, uh, worrying about what happens under failure events. These can be uh, big drivers for, for productivity improvements. Um, having operational resilience, and I mentioned it before, but having the ability to very easily stand up disaster recovery scenarios uh, or redundancy in your environment without having to invest in a tremendous amount of extra uh, uh, capital expenditures or management expenditures, and those operational things it takes to, 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 to actually physically manage uh, redundant kind of environments. And then I also mentioned business agility. This is really a big one um, in a dynamic world, which I think we live in, uh, the ability to respond almost instantaneously to either a scale up or scale down of your business or scale up or scale down of particular workloads or processes uh, is really a major benefit to going to a public lab. So this is from IDC, uh, which is a big analyst firm. Uh, on average, 30%-ish or so uh, cost reduction in average infrastructure. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means and how to really realize that kind of savings because it might not be intuitively obvious. Uh, but we'll talk definitely some more about how you actually uh, get those benefits. Definitely fewer downtime, downtime hours, um, especially if you architect it well in the cloud, uh, which is something like a like a consulting partner like Track, it can help you uh, help you make sure of that you're correctly architected. Uh, big boof, big boost in IT staff uh, taking the mundane work of day-to-day -day management of physical hardware uh, and let them really focus on things that can add value to the uh, add value to the company and the businesses that you're in. And it. It's much easier to add new features and new capabilities into your environment. So you really can unleash the capabilities of your IT staff or your engineering staff to start delivering much faster um, and incremental uh, features into your, uh, into your environment. 
So these are sort of the questions that we hear. Um, how do you actually create a business case for saying, yeah, I'm gonna move off premise or on premise to off premise into a public cloud? Even, how do I even get started with this? It can be daunting for a lot of people. Um, and again, a lot of these things are things that somebody like uh, Tracka can help with. Um, if you have relationships with uh, AWS team and solution architects there, uh, good places to go. Uh, if you have other people who you know in your network who have gone through the same thing, maybe at different companies or different parts of your organization, uh, these are places to go for some of these answers. Um, how do you manage things? How do I migrate the workloads? How do I, and a big one, excuse me, is how do I, how do I train my team uh, and how do I get them to buy in to moving to what's really a new, uh, a new compute paradigm in many cases. Um, moving along the journey of moving to the public cloud uh, can seem daunting at first, but I think once you get that big toe wet, it becomes very easy. And what we found is that in particular, engineers who might've been set in their ways or some administrators who might've been set in their ways before, uh, see a whole new world open up in front of them. And it's a great opportunity for them to increase their skill set, uh, to learn new things, uh, as well as to help rethink how they architect, which could bring benefits up and down the organization. So what is actually the process and something like uh, somebody to help you can really help with. So it all starts up front, really. So let's assess, does it make sense at all for you to change what you're doing and move a workload into a public cloud like AWS? So really there's the most important part of this, I think, is the conversations with the early, with the stakeholders. So who has ownership of a particular workload or a particular environment? Uh, and what are their, what are their uh, goals and strategies going forward. So it's really key to make sure that those stakeholders uh, are bought in to this. And frankly, you know, they should have the right of denial as well. Um, so these are the people who, who, who were serving with these workloads and with this infrastructure. So needs to serve their purposes. So we need to understand that. Um, are there other areas of input where we should be gathering data to understand uh, whether to make this move or not. Um, management, low-level engineering, users, uh, what are their experiences now? What should they be? Are those uh, the right kind of fit for moving to a public cloud like AWS? Um, so from a focus on the overall assessment, once you do have some buy-in from the stakeholders, then let's take a look at the real, uh, the different parts that go into getting ready to make a change. So is the business ready? Is the business capable of doing a move with or without assistance? And if not, where are the gaps? Will the people buy into it? Are they ready to do it? Uh, from a government, governance standpoint, do we really understand the important parts that we need to pay attention uh, to in terms of usage and security and control of the environment? Um, is what you're trying to move uh, technically the right thing to move? So what is it? Uh, what are the performance and uh, efficiency and uptime requirements that are necessary to make sure that technically it's really going to be a good move? Uh, from a platform standpoint, uh, where does it run now? How does it run? And where is it going to run in the future? And how should it run in the future? And these aren't necessarily something as simple as lift and shift one database from an on-premise system to a database in the cloud, but maybe there's a better way. Um, so those are things that from a platform standpoint, you wanna understand. And then security, always security. Uh, so we'd say obviously becoming much more important and has been for, for years, but it seems to even be accelerating now how important. Um, that your environment be secure and what are the risks, uh, what mitigations or remediations might we have to do and are we compliance with the best practices, not only of your own company, but best practices of what's going on in the rest of the world as well. And once we get there, then we can decide, okay, is this something that's ready to be moved or not? So we get to the results stage. 
assuming that things do line up and it does make sense, the next steps are really the planning uh, part of the actual move. So there's certainly a discovery step where we really wanna get down to the nuts and bolts. So what information at the core level is needed about the current infrastructure environment? So what assets do you have out there? What's really being used, what's not? What kind of performance levels are being delivered? Are they good enough? Uh, are we gonna to need to do better? How are things configured in terms of the applications? Is there, how do you do configuration management? Um, What's the overall architecture look like? What kind of tribal knowledge is there in the organization about how things really run? Uh, hopefully there's good documentation, but we found that oftentimes it just resides in somebody's head. Uh, we need to capture that. And then what kind of SLAs do we need to provide uh, once, once the, the cloud solution is deployed? What, people do, what, what do people expect from, a, from an from an uptime standpoint, from a performance standpoint, from a user experience standpoint. So that's the discovery phase. Once we understand all that, then we can really start to organize the different parts of the deliverables. So here's the applications and the profiles that we are gonna to need to move. Here's what the core infrastructure looks like that's going to be moved to a cloud. Here's a performance envelope that we need to make sure we meet. And there's a whole bunch more in there as well. Um, here's the uh, SLAs and uptimes and redundancy that we're going to need to meet as well. And then AWS likes to call them the four, the seven R's of architecture. When you make a move is the right time to look at this stuff. Uh, are there certain parts of your workload that should frankly be retired because they're not being used or they're lost or they're orphaned? Um, what do we need to retain as the converse of that? Um, are there some things that should be relocated? Databases are a really good example of this. There's lots of databases that you can use in the cloud that might be compatible with what you have today, it might be more cost effective or more scalable or more uh, robust. This is a good time to look at that, for example. Uh, Rehost as well. I'm running on X kind of processing environment today. Maybe I should be looking at Y moving to the cloud. Uh, repurchase. Uh, this generally uh, points at things like software licensing. Um, I might have bought a license one way in the past. Do I want to do it the same way in the cloud? There's typically a different, uh, a bigger variety of ways that you can actually license software and other applications when you move to the cloud. Uh, Replatform. Uh, kind of ties into the, some of the other things I've talked about before, what kind of compute instances or storage instances, or what kind of application instances I use. And then refactor being at the highest level of effort. Um, refactor is where we can really gain a lot of advantages by moving to public cloud. Uh, historically, a lot of the software people run in house is, is monolithic software architectures. Um, in the cloud, there's this huge move to serverless uh, architectures where instead of having to buy a full CPU instance, uh, instead you can might, you might be able to refactor your software to use uh, small microservices uh, or serverless instances like AWS Lambda, which instead of having to fully uh, uh, fully take a whole instance or or reserve a full instance for your use, you can just submit a small little job and you only pay by the second of the actual CPU usage that you actually use when a serverless or, or Lambda-based environment. So refactoring is a very powerful tool. It doesn't have to be done overnight, but it's something that over time can really improve the overall cost, your scalability, um, and your and, and future-proofing of, uh, of your software environment. Very, very powerful when you move to the cloud. And once you figure all that stuff out, then you can really start to migrate the environment. Um, in the planning phase for the migrations, I'll actually describe in a couple of the case studies that we have uh, in a few minutes. Um, but the migration part is usually, you know, a, a typical kind of a migration. You plan it, you plan a, down, you plan a, uh, a migration window, you migrate it, you test it, and then you cut over. Um, the modernized part is something that's an incremental thing. 
um, and it should be part of the overall plan as well. Uh, just like you work on your current and on-premise infrastructure, having a plan to modernize your cloud-based infrastructure is something that you should think about and actually much easier to do in a much more um, uh, small step, incremental kind of way in the cloud. And actually, I should have uh, gone to this slide before talking about that. So it's really, there's a the, the two kind of approaches. So migrating a monolithic application is kind of the way people are used to doing it, especially on premise. I'm gonna move out one piece of gear, move my applications to a new piece of gear, uh, essentially rehosting those applications. Uh, but follow on to that, we should really take a look over time at those monolithic applications and find out what we can modernize. Modernizing might be not necessarily um, moving to completely new applications, but finding if there's ways that we can use these new kind of uh, application constructs like serverless to move to modernized applications that one could work better, uh, but also be much more cost effective um, and also much easier to incrementally upgrade over time. And then there's for applications that you haven't yet migrated. Uh, what should be migrated? Maybe you move one workload first, and then over time you start migrating some other ones. But those then you have an opportunity to look at, do you just rehost like we did above? Or do we do something different to re-architect over time and migrate those in a way, migrate and refactor at the same time, uh, splitting those off into serverless kind of environment off from this monolithic application, which is the way most legacy applications are today. Um, and over time, uh, get yourself into a really modern way to, uh, to run your infrastructure as well as your application base. So if you look at it for kind of a, from a summary standpoint, just the overall journey, I mean, there's no, no news here, uh, but do a good job up front. Let's make sure we understand who all the stakeholders are, who the users are, uh, who's running the environment today. Uh, make sure that those targets, those workloads, those applications are really good targets for a migration. Um, select the right tools to do it. Uh, and that could be with a partner like, like Trackit, could be on your own, uh, could be with AWS directly in some large cases. Uh, but there's lots and lots of really good tools. We'll talk about one of them uh, in a couple of the case studies ahead of time. There's some very, very good tools to help you uh, to make to make on a good, efficient, uh, cost-effective move. The migration of the application itself, like any migration, you just want to make sure you really plan this one down to the five nines of it. Uh, after you do do the migration, um, you know, let's get it into an area before we go public, before it goes into production, make sure that it's performing as expected. And then once we do go into production, continue that. So let's make sure it's, um, it's well, uh, well measured. We have everything in place uh, to instrument how it's working um, and, and, and that it performs as expected, if not better. So let's make that part of the overall migration phase and then look forward to the future part of it. What, uh, what else can you migrate? What else can you improve on the, the current migration as well as our other workloads or applications for the future? Uh, and that usually does, especially for large organizations, does seem to happen in waves. So for example, you might get an accounting department going first with some of their applications, and then the engineering department, and then the sales department or whatever. So kind of typical way for things to happen. Let's talk about a couple of case studies. We've done these very recently. Um, these were fairly simple, but these companies also it's sort of their first experience with moving into the public cloud. So I think it's good for somebody who's just really getting started. So Avantgarde Marketing Solutions, I don't know why it's called Marketing Solutions, but the company is actually a company that does contactless payment processing. So they're the back end, they're at the back end of credit card processing or, or um, uh, some of the online payment schemes that are out there today. So it's the whole back end to be able to put together the banks with the processing companies. Um, so they had just kind of a storage problem and they had on-premise storage. Some of it was on Windows, some of it was Mac OS. Uh, it was in a data center. 
Uh, and as their business became more and more geographically dispersed, the performance was getting worse and worse because they just had essentially a single environment for it and they were a hop away from the internet as it was anyway, uh, limited by some bandwidth up to the cloud. Uh, their equipment was getting old, so they had a choice to either upgrade the current equipment in one way or another, as well as upgrade the network connections. Um, and the data center was in, was private data center, wasn't the best. <clears throat> so there's some challenges there as well, cooling power, the usual kind of things. Uh, so we decided to really look at the cloud option. Um, and what we did for them is we migrated their Windows environments or the Windows file server environments, as well as their Mac OS file server environments into a single one for them. Uh, we did find, we did have some challenges with this. The actual migration uh, of the data wasn't all that difficult. Uh, we built some uh, synchronization capabilities to the on-premise, to the cloud environment as we were going through the process. So we could have a clean, cl clean cut over at the end of it. Um, but there were some problems. Uh, one of the things that anybody who uses Unix file servers, services like, like on the Mac versus Windows, that there's naming constraints that nobody seemed to knew were there. Uh, and these guys had uh, tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands of files. And turns out a lot of those files on the Mac OS environment were compatible with the Windows file services. So we had to rationalize that. We built some scripts to find files that didn't meet the Windows naming constraints, uh, flag those files, some case fix those files, the ones that were important, and then move those over. Um, we used a product called AWS Cloud Endure, which we actually use in the, in the next case study as well. But Cloud Endure is a really cool product from AWS that helps synchronize uh, entire images from one environment to the AWS Cloud environment. Uh, so it's a really quick, easy, and reliable way to move things over whole. And it was especially important in the next case study that I'll talk about. So at the end of the day, Avant-Garde has a single consolidated file system environment. Um, with a couple of separated namespaces, but they're all on AWS. They're now off their, uh, they're now off their on-premise environment. Uh, their users are getting the same or better um, performance than they did in the past, and now they can scale just as needed in a very easy way. <clears throat> and also, before they didn't have any uh, disaster recovery capability. We haven't implemented that for them just yet, but that's going to be the next step. And it's going to be very, very easy, non-disruptive thing for us to do to build, um, to build a redundant environment in case uh, uh, their California instance falls into the Pacific Ocean. Hopefully not, <laughs> but it'll be easy to do. We got a very nice quote from the creative manager there who owns all the infrastructure. Um, it, there, there was a very large partner, um, one of the big six that they talked to with this, who wanted to charge them. I think it was close to 10 times what we did for them and, and wouldn't commit to a delivery date. Uh, we helped them with that, got them a really cost effective solution. Uh, and I think they're very happy with the work where they did and they're a nice public reference for us. Uh, and you can find their case study in our website, a uh, more full version of that in the case study section of our website. Not surprisingly. Cobra USA is a really cool company. Uh, these guys are based in Texas. They build aftermarket products for, for motorcycles, you know, the big hogs, like a lot of Harley Davidson things. So if you ever need some really cool tailpipe, chrome tailpipes for your Harley, I uh, encourage you to go to Cobra USA. They have some really, really great products. Uh, they had a different sort of problem. So their website where they do their e-commerce from, so you can order from their website, um, but they also have their, uh, their distributors and uh, vendors, uh, distributors and resellers working with their website as well, it was on old Windows Server box. And I believe it was Windows Server 2008, maybe 2012, but an old version of Windows. Um, and unfortunately, some of their applications that they're running on their website were, had, had dependencies on those old Windows versions, which means they couldn't upgrade to Windows 10, for example, uh, which would be what they really wanted. So there were some real challenges there in terms of being able to fully lift and shift their current environment. Um, we also used AWS Cloud Endure for this one. 
uh, it was a really interesting process because we needed to see what they were actually running. And in fact, here's a case where there was really a lot of tribal knowledge about what was in their site, not necessarily very well documented. So we really needed to understand that tribal knowledge. Uh, in doing so, we understood what was going to be easy and what was going to be hard, um, especially from a refactoring standpoint, which frankly, until they get ready to uh, eliminate some of those uh, eliminate some of those windows dependencies is going to be really hard to do but they're going to be a very good uh, uh, possibility in a future refactor what they currently do so we did some extensive planning um, and they had a very short window they are a 24 7 operation uh, so all their customers need to access that website 24 7 since they are around the world <clears throat> so we had a very uh, tight uh, cutover window that we wanted to meet uh, so we did an initial migration into a um, into a development environment um, in AWS, did a bunch of testing, and then we actually did the cutover. It was in a, less than a two hour window where we successfully completed the full migration. Uh, this was like a pure lift and shift. And it was, it was as, uh, as their uh, VP said, it was in the VP of sales and marketing, so he was the main stakeholder, right? Because he's in charge of making sure that his customers can get access to the Cobra website. Uh, he, he called it an intense situation and it was in the timeline. And the, the, the main reason, by the way, that these guys had to make the move was that they had a, a cloud hosting provider who decided to shut down their business. So there was a hard stop for them. Uh, they had a limited amount of time when they, and they procrastinated a little bit too long uh, found us late. Uh, they had a hard cutoff time when they absolutely had to move off of that old uh, hosting provider. Uh, so as you might imagine, they were a little nervous about it, uh, but managed to get the job done just under the wire when the, uh, the old hosting provider uh, shut their doors. That was really a nice one and the customer is uh, uh, a happy one. And again, there's going to be a bunch of refactoring and optimization here, I think in the future, as well as moving some of their other in-house uh, IT along with it. This is their first first dipping of the toe into the cloud, uh, the cloud computing business. I think that pretty much is most of what I wanted to cover today. Um, so we're happy to help uh, anyone or, or answer any questions about, uh, about uh, migration needs, other AWS uh, questions that we have, we're here to help. Uh, we're easy to get a hold of. We're at trackit.io. Uh, Ludo and I are happy to answer any questions that we might have at this time. Um, any questions out there? I don't think I've manually muted everybody. Anybody? No? I don't have a question. I just want to say it's very informative and it gives me the, I mean, it kind of proves that you need some partner like you guys. To walk you through because it's a whole lot to think about and despite you have all the tools you still can run into walls and make mistakes and waste money potentially but i think yeah. it was a very good presentation thank you i appreciate it there is one thing i should mention and probably should have mentioned it earlier um aws is aws especially is pretty uh, aggressive about trying to help people on board into aws services and if you work with specifically an advanced consult consulting partner at AWS, we can oftentimes get some funding from AWS itself to help pay for our engineering to help with the move. Um, so we do this quite often and AWS, I mean, they run a business. So what they like to look for is, okay, somebody's gonna move something new into our cloud. How much monthly revenue is AWS gonna get at the end of the 12 month period. So they look out 12 months, say, okay, 12 months, this customer is gonna spend X amount of money a month with us. Uh, we'll give them some percentage of a yearly spend towards the onboarding of a new service or new workload into AWS. Uh, one of the real benefits of, and we really thank AWS for that because it helps drive some people, some business towards uh, consulting partners like us. So it's a really nice program um, and if, Thinking about moving any sort of workloads to AWS, it's always a good thing to explore because if there is a decent amount of spend that's going to be associated with it, we can usually get some money to defray the costs of the move.
Okay. Well, I uh, want to thank everybody for attendance. If there's no more questions, uh, I think we can uh, we can probably end. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Okay. Well, thank you very much for attending. We appreciate it. We're always here to answer any questions, and I hope everybody has a great day. Bye-bye now.